I love musical theater. <laughs> what opens your heart like that? Is that you? Is that you this morning, right here in this room, or live streaming? Maybe you're live streaming because that's you. Waving through the window, waiting for somebody to see you. You need relief, relief from your loneliness, relief from your isolation. It breaks my heart to know that there are people in this community, in this church, people all around me that feel this way, that could sing that song, that feel overlooked and unwanted. And that's why we're in this four-week series, to kick off this new year, to kick off this decade. A series that I hope will help you find relief from a number of issues. When I look back over the last year, 2019, it was full of a lot of emotion, a lot of changes, lots of fun things, but also lots of hard stress, tension. Some weeks just felt like we were grinding through. And I was just saying to somebody the other day, the last three weeks of the year have felt like a year, right? Good and bad, it was a lot. And I'm personally just ready to, to let things slow down a little bit, maybe even force them to slow down so that I can assess where I am spiritually, emotionally, physically, and, and figure out what needs to change, what needs to get better, what needs to go away. How can I find relief? Barry started us off last weekend by talking about how peace can help us find relief from fear and anxiety. And in the next couple of weeks, we'll be looking at relief from the insecurity of eternity and the relief from feeling insignificant. But today, we're looking at how to find relief from loneliness and isolation. A study published by the global health service company Cigna found that 46% of US adults report sometimes or always feeling lonely. And 47% report feeling left out. That's almost half the population. Cigna says these are epidemic levels. Only around half of Americans say that they have meaningful in-person social interaction on a daily basis. Generation Z, or those between the ages of 19 and 22, were the loneliest generation with a loneliness score of 48.3. And that ranges from 20 to 80. They were 48.3. Millennials and Generation X are close behind them. The report also found that Americans who live with others are less likely to feel lonely, which makes sense. However, this doesn't hold up for single parents or guardians who report higher levels of loneliness than adults who live alone. We all have single parents in our lives, and they feel lonelier than people that live alone. Research shows that loneliness is connected to a number of health issues, including diabetes, heart disease, and depression. It plays a role in substance abuse and can diminish the overall quality of your life. Some studies have even found that loneliness and social isolation may lead to an early death. It also, another study said that one in five seniors, that's the other end of the spectrum, feel lonely every single day. And loneliness is more dangerous than obesity and as damaging to help health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. The world's lonely. People are isolated. And again, maybe you're feeling that way today. Maybe you're in my situation where you are living in uh, the world right now and you're dealing with two lonely generations. You're dealing with maybe aging parents that are lonely and then your kids that are dealing with loneliness too. Loneliness is defined as the quality of being unfrequented. I thought that term was interesting, feeling unfrequented. Why do people feel so lonely? I have some thoughts on this. This isn't an exhaustive list, but here are some thoughts on why people might feel lonely or isolated. They're facing extreme circumstances, going through trauma, life change. They feel misunderstood, unlovable. Maybe they're depressed or anxious, like I talked about earlier. That can make you feel lonely. 
this list that I just said can also cause other people to move away from you and isolate you. People don't want to engage with someone that's going through trauma in their lives because that's hard. Or if you misunderstand somebody, it's just easier not to deal with them. And isolation is without relation to other people. Social media is also added to this, right? It's easier to isolate yourself from real people when you've got a world happening in front of you on your screens. And you can engage in these so pseudo relationships of this created world, but that's not really what we were created for. We need as human beings face to face interaction. Also people that are physically incapacitated or extremely ill may be faced or forced into isolation. Then as I was looking up definitions, I discovered this other interesting word, isolationism. I'd never heard of this. The definition is a policy of remaining apart from the affairs or interests of other groups, especially the political affairs, affairs of other countries. So this is a political phrase, but it kind of sounds like what we're doing right now as individuals, isolating ourselves from others, even people that we love and that care about us because our interests and ideas don't agree. It's easier to just disengage than to try to understand each other and accept each other's differences and stay in relationship. So all of this leads to a very deserted, desolate, empty, reclusive, solitary, estranged, secluded, withdrawn existence. It's a lonely world. So how do we find relief from this? In order to help us figure this out, we're going to look at the book of John, John 15. So if you want to turn to page 887 in your house Bibles, it's also on your app. If you're live streaming, you can find it on the app or a Bible in your home. So this is near the end of Jesus' life. He is with his disciples, and where this passage falls is in the midst of a conversation that begins toward the end of John 13, just a couple of chapters ahead. And this is right after Judas Iscariot has left the room, and Jesus realizes the betrayal is near. When that door shuts behind Judas, it's like there's an urgency in the room. Time is short. Jesus realizes this, and there's much that he wants and needs to tell the 11 that are left. Throughout chapters 14 through 16, Jesus is explaining to them the fact that he's going away and that they can't follow him just yet. He's showing it, them what it will mean for their future life, their own sorrow and joy, and their mission in the world. It's right before the arrest in the garden. And the passage we're looking at today is right in the middle of this whole scene. So I want you to picture yourself at this table with Jesus like the disciples, hanging on to every word that their remarkable leader has to say. We're going to pick it up in verse 9, John 15, verse 9. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with joy Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, love each other. The cure for loneliness and isolation is love. It sounds really simple and pretty easy to love, to feel love. And yet when you get right down to it, when you really look into what Jesus means in his words, it is one of the most difficult commandments we follow and obey. But it's the most important. Jesus' answer here is very clear about how important love is. Look at verse 9. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. Right away, the emphasis is love. Love begins with the Father and flows through the Son to his disciples. 
to us. So the Father loves Jesus, and Jesus loves you, and the disciples, like us, had seen this love played out over and over. What does it mean, then, to remain in that love, that love of Jesus? The Greek word meno means dwelling in a particular place, remaining there, abiding there. And when used in relationships, it means a steadfast relationship, heart and soul unity. To remain in Jesus' love then suggests being immersed in Jesus' love, surrounded by Jesus' love, comforted by Jesus' love, empowered by the love of Jesus. Barry used the image of water last week in his message. Imagine a lake, going with that theme, a lake not filled with water, but filled with the love of Jesus. When we find the courage to dive in, we will find ourselves in a new and different world, refreshing quiet, cut off from the noise and distractions, supportive, a place where we are upheld by Jesus' love, abiding and remaining in Jesus' love. Jesus goes on in verse 10, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. When we obey, we are abiding in Jesus and ultimately abiding in the Father. Jesus invites us to obedience so that we may abide in him and therefore abide in the Father. The marriage of grace and obedience, the marriage of faith and works, this is abiding and remaining, accepting the grace and obeying the commandments. Jesus then says, I have spoken these things to you that my joy may remain in you and your joy may be made full. Jesus isn't calling us to obedience, this dreary, shackled obedience, but to a joy, a joy that can be found in obedience. Not a joy in the hollow things of life, things that bring us happiness, whatever that is for the moment, but that go away or change. No, he's talking about joy of a disciplined life. I think of um, an athlete or a student, um, and when you work really hard for your next event or your next test, and I've tried over and over to impart this to my children about test taking and the joy of doing well. Um, It's worked really well with two of them. The other two aren't picking up on it so much. Um, I won't tell you which ones. That would be rude, Um, but anyway. When you work really hard and you get to the end and you've succeeded, that you've aced the test, you've, you've done well in the race, it doesn't matter how many blisters you have or if your brain hurts, the joy of the accomplishment fills your soul. It's the joy of victory and that is what Jesus is talking about here when he's talking about joy. Verse 12, this is my commandment, love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. This is a repeat of what Jesus has said just a few verses before in John 13, 34. So now I'm giving you a new commandment, love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. If Jesus is repeating something over and over, it must be really important something he wants to make sure the disciples and that we understand. The commandments of verse 10 are now narrowed down to just one simple phrase in verse 12, loving one another as Jesus has loved us. This gospel, the gospel of John, doesn't emphasize the moral teachings in the way that Matthew does. The Sermon on the Mount includes many specific teachings that are missing here. Part of the reason is because John's a different writer and a different person with a different style and emphasis. But it's also true that Jesus' love commandment pulls together all of the law and the prophets. The person who loves doesn't need to be told not to kill or lie or steal because you don't do those things when you're loving. You don't do that. Love supersedes everything. Augustine said, love and do what thou wilt. Love. The agape love that Jesus commands here is a doing, not a feeling. 
It doesn't mean that we even necessarily approve of everything the person is doing or, or we approve of the person or that we even necessarily like them that much. It means that we act on behalf of that person. We demonstrate our love in a practical way. An agape person will do what is possible to feed the hungry and, and give a drink to the thirsty and welcome the stranger. The agape person has little or nothing to gain by helping the hungry and the thirsty and the lonely. The gist of their love is giving, not getting. And that's totally countercultural. That's the world turned upside down, which is what Jesus does, right? Our culture says it's all about getting. What do I get out of this? Where are my rights? What do I gain? We're talking about a giving, sacrificial love. Verse 13, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. At this point, the disciples don't understand what this means. They don't know that Jesus will soon die for all of them. After the resurrection, they'll finally understand the significance of these words. Jesus' love requires him to go to the cross for his friends. His commandment to love each other as he has loved us is a high calling. It's a serious sacrifice. It's not a feeling. It's love in action, love that pays a price. Verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father has told me. There's no shame in being attached to being God's servant. The people identified in the Bible as God's servant include Moses and Joshua and David and Paul and James. Jesus even acted as a servant to his disciples when he washed their feet. But now Jesus is referring to the disciples as his friends this doesn't mean equal. Jesus is still Lord and expects obedience, but he is sharing with them in a new way, an intimate way, sharing trust. He is offering them access to himself. You are his friend. Finishing up in verse 16, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, love each other. People probably wondered what Jesus was thinking, thinking when he chose this very ordinary group of disciples. And yet the growth of the first century church shows that Jesus chose well or empowered well. These disciples will do great things, not because they are great, but because the one who empowers them is great. He tells them to bear fruit and he's not specific in that because they're going to need to seek his will and discover what their calling is and what their fruit is that they will bear. And when you're living in the midst of his will, he will give you what you ask for because it is his will you are living in. If you have surrendered to Jesus and are abiding in God and listening intently to the Holy Spirit, then he will give you what you ask for because what you ask for is what he wants to give you. Your will is his will. Your life is intertwined with his. You are attuned to what he wants. I think many times we think we can live mediocre spiritual lives, not abiding in him, and we're going to get what we ask for. It does not work like that. Abide in him so that you know what he wants for you before he gives it to you. And Jesus finishes this section with the commandment to love one another. A mandate that he says often. The cure for loneliness and isolation is love. And I think Jesus is saying two things here that we can take away from this passage. I love you, remain in my love, and love each other. And this is what's going to bring you relief from your loneliness. Remain in his love. You are chosen. You are his friend. Surrender to Jesus' love. Understand that you are totally and completely and unconditionally loved by the God of the universe. Abide in that love. Remain in that love. 
To remain in his love, again, remember, is to be immersed in Jesus' love, surrounded by his love, comforted by his love, empowered by his love. Dive into that love and you don't have to be alone ever again. He is right there with you always. You have a relationship that will never leave you, will never forsake you, no matter what you do or say. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, no matter what. And he will give you purpose. That's a reason to get out of bed every morning. That's a reason to engage in the world. Remind yourself of that every day through scripture, through meditation. Pray to that end. Serve. Serve. When you start serving others and focusing on their needs, you start to forget your problems. We have this amazing care center. We need you to serve back there. Find a community. Join our next session of Rooted in the spring or come to our meetups that we have often at our campuses. Join groups that you get to be around all sorts of people. The drama team is this crazy mix of people and we love being together and we're there for each other. Find a group that can be there for you. Come to church. Let us love you. Let us include you. I have several friends that because of circumstances in their lives, they could be lonely. They could feel isolated. And yet they are emboldened by the love that they know they have in Jesus. And they push out into the world and grasp it and move into it and push through it with determination. And their grit and perseverance is inspiring to me. So you can do some things to help you not feel lonely and to move out of that isolated state, to find some relief. But I'm gonna go down a different road here and say that I don't believe that it is strictly up to you to find relief from your loneliness. There is a community around you that needs to also come to your rescue. You are part of a church. Or maybe today you're exploring becoming part of a church. This church, Grace Church. And we as the church, as a community, are responsible for the lonely and isolated. His commandment is to love each other. So for a moment, I want to talk to you, those of you that are not lonely, that don't feel isolated. The love that Jesus is talking about in this passage is the love that you are to show to each other. Moving into the lives around you, pulling them out of their isolation, healing them from their loneliness, an active, determined love. And it is not going to be easy. Loving like this is not easy. You're going to have to dig in and do hard work. When Rick and Kay Warren's son took his life several years ago, Rick is the pastor of Saddleback Church, Kay talked about how close friends came alongside them to help them rebuild their lives. She said that her friends said to them, we figured that because your life changed forever, ours would too. That's the kind of love I'm talking about. An active, determined, dangerous, difficult, profound love. Our lonely and isolated friends need to see us move into their lives with that kind of love. Look around you, who needs you? Who needs your companionship? Who needs you to be their friend, to be their family? Who needs you to show up with no expectations, but just to love them and bring them into relationship? I think we can learn a lot from Winnie the Pooh. I love Winnie the Pooh. And there was this quote that says, one awesome thing about Eeyore, Eeyore is that even though he is basically clinically depressed, and I would say isolated and lonely, he still gets invited to participate in adventures and shenanigans with his friends. They never expect him to pretend to feel happy. They never leave him behind or ask him to change. They just show him love. Can you make this new year one where you look for those around you that might need you? Listen when the Spirit says to you to move into their lives. Engage with them even when it's hard or messy. 
Invite them and include them into your world, your family, your friends, your group. Everyone on the drama team is there because someone invited them. They didn't show up. Someone invited them and asked them into that group and that you will support and encourage them to keep moving out into the world. Make this a year of relief from loneliness and isolation that you can show them the bold, unconditional love of Jesus. There is no reason that someone that is engaged in a church or engaged in the community of Christ or engaged even with one Christian, Christ follower, should ever be lonely. We should make sure that never happens. Above all, clothe yourselves with love which binds us all together in perfect harmony. What if we were the example to the world of what it looks like to love the lonely and engage the isolated? What if we were a people, that people were drawn to this place because they knew if they came here, they would never be lonely again? What if we were the church in the truest sense of the word, a place people wanna be, a people that people wanna be with, a place of refuge, a place of relief? What if 2020 were our year of radical love, this decade, our decade of radical love, a love concerned with giving and not getting, a love that left no one lonely or isolated, a love that made the rest of the world sit up and take notice. It's time. Because when you listen to the words of Jesus, our remarkable late leader, it's not a suggestion. It's an expectation. It's a mandate. Love each other as I have loved you. That's a deep, bold, sacrificial love. There are people in this community, in this church, maybe sitting next to you today that are waving through a window. Please see me. Please notice me. Please include me. Please love me. Can you be that person? Can we please be that church? Thanks for watching, but don't stop there. We want you to find community at Grace Church, and the first step in doing that is going to gracechurch.us slash hub. There you'll find other sermons, details about upcoming events, and other important announcements. You'll also find service times and locations for all three of our Grace Church campuses. We would love for you to join us. And make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out when we post something new. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.